next session, as, uh, as Chris mentioned, um, is all focused uh, on technology. Um, we've just heard about some fantastic initiatives, uh, but also some real home truths about where some, uh, some potential gains uh, and increased efficiencies will make a real impact from driver productivity, labor shortages, paper transactions, uh, improving communication and speeding up that communication, uh, and visibility across key stakeholders too, uh, which is where uh, technology can come in. And today and right now, we're gonna have three real innovators um, to come up and uh, showcase some game-changing technologies and solutions that can really reduce time to market uh, and improve those efficiencies. So we're gonna start off with a couple of presentations, then we're gonna get into a, into a discussion as well. So uh, I'd like to welcome my first guest to the stage, Mr. Ed Jones, Chief Commercial Officer of De Gould. So Ed, please come and join us. Um, good morning, thanks for having us. Um, evening for us, we're sort of all over the place, time zones and things, but uh, <laughs> it's great to be here. First time at this conference, which is exciting. Great location and lovely to see lots of people. Those guys were obviously a little bit hungry, um, but you can tell them afterwards how great it was. Um, so pl plan today, um, Rich was kind enough to ask us to do a bit of speaking. <coughs> I've become a called De Gould. Uh, I, I know some of you would have heard of us because we work with some of you. Some of you may be learning about us for the first time. My plan wasn't to talk lots about De Gould today. Um, my plan's more to talk about how we can utilize technology, how we can collaborate, how us as suppliers can come up with new ideas and help you guys a little bit um, in terms of OEMs and finished vehicle logistics, but also collaborate together. And some of the things we've heard so far this morning seem to be very similar themes. And I think they've been similar themes for a few years. Whilst there's been loads of chaos and headwinds through automotive, the same trends seem to be coming through. And it's about being able to digitize, being able to have consistent data that we can use, being able to have visibility from end to end through the supply chain and how we can all collaborate and introduce new technologies for that. So hopefully um, I know a little bit about that and can help. There's also some other um, great speakers on the panel in a second which will introduce their products, um, which I think can also be something you guys can use. So in terms of the Gould, I'm gonna really quickly tell you um, a bit about us guys. And then if you wanna grab me over the next few days, I'd love to tell you a bit more um, about the particular products and things that we use. Um, we, we're based over in the UK. Uh, and, but we do do a lot of work already in the US. Um, we were an independent company that was set up around 10 years ago now and have been doing this for quite a long time. And, and the biggest thing I've seen change in that time is we used to go and speak to particularly the OEMs, but also the finished vehicle uh, logistics partners and, and whether it's shipping lines, port terminals, yard operations, etc. These used to be kind of crazy that people didn't want to know too much about or kind of went, yeah, great idea, but we don't get it. We don't know how to implement it. We don't know where to pull the budget from. Um, what we're seeing now is a massive shift in that attitude. And what we're seeing is people are now more and more coming to us um, and, and asking how quick can we get these things in and how can we do this? Because I think despite all the headwinds and despite all the things that have been going on in the last few years, it, it's kind of accelerated some, the need for some of this technology and people are starting to realize that in terms of data and visibility. We've got some really nice uh, automotive experience on our, on our board as a company ourselves. We're technology and innovation, but so we've sort of, uh, in, in, in being imposters in this industry, but then have some help along the way. So, in fact, some of our colleagues from Valenius, uh, who are one of our, our partners and investors um, as, as of the last, last year, uh, are here today. And we also have another U.S. automotive group based out of Phoenix. So it means we've got quite a nice foothold in, on the U.S. side as well. Um, I think we've got six different plants that we're working in over here with four different OEMs um, and also a lot of other things throughout Europe and the rest of the world. Um, in that time, we've sort of grown a little bit and our, our philosophy and what we always want to do is listen to what the customers want and try and come up with those solutions and try and come up with things that uh, are customer driven and customer led and try and sort of future gaze a little bit as to what that might be because you can imagine it takes a bit of time and R&D to, to get there. But our specialisms are in things like AI, computer vision, automation in a wider sense um, and integrating that software to make it accessible to everybody. So I mentioned some of those sites um, and, and you saw some of the customers and things that we work with. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's quite a few of them. In the US side, uh, I mentioned, and uh, outside of that in China, South Africa, Europe, um, quite a lot in the UK, as you can imagine. And some of the, the customers that we've got are quite 
UK-centric initially, and it's been great to have a, a wider adoption since then. One of the things that we found quite interesting and quite useful is how to integrate this information, how to use this information. So for those who don't know at all what we do, uh, I'll give you a bit of a clue on our product before the next slide, but we offer automated vehicle inspections. And I call them inspections now, it used to be imagery. And for me, that's still one of the strongest suits is if you can capture a car at a point of time, ideally at the end of line in a plant and then through the chain. So um, Chris and Steve this morning were talking about how many different handoffs there are and how we can share that information. Every time a car passes from one person to the next, it's important to understand the condition of that car, not just to make a decision there and then, but also retrospectively, if you get a claim from a dealer or you get something down the line, how do we look back and how do we know what was true at that point in time? And the idea came initially from the rental car market. We've all rented cars probably in the last couple of days. And even now, I still find you rent a car, they don't know the condition, you're not sure the condition, uh, and, and, and the onus is on the customer to go and check it and then come back to them and you argue about who caused the damage. And that's why initially we thought, well, why, why can't we do this with some evidence-based? Why can't we use CCTV pretty much as, as uh, used to be the case? And why can't we take the right type of images in the right type of environment to make that pretty undisputable and evidence-based? And, and that will be a useful tool. You take the VIN, you take the date and time and location, and you create a 360 degree image of that vehicle to understand exactly what it looked like at that point of time. Since then, it's evolved into AI and being able to automatically find defects and damages and spec check and these sorts of things. But throughout all of this, for me, the main point has been to get the right images in the first place and they become the enabler for anything else you wanna do with those. Once you've got that data, it's about how we share that data, how we make sure everybody can access it, um, right to create that visibility through the, through the chain. Now, one of the other things, and I think it was mentioned again earlier on in terms of dealership models and new models, and one of the other shifts we've seen in the last few years, for us, the same images and the same image quality using the same hardware systems can be used for different things. On OEM plant level, kind of at the end of line, in handover from warranty to logistics, for me, one of the strongest things is to find, make sure the vehicle is built correctly in the first place, so build conformity and spec check. I didn't realize how many times that can go wrong um, and the wrong wheels or the wrong wing mirrors or the wrong colors or different things on either side never, never ceases to amaze me. But we can capture that and we can, we can spin that round. And I know that's been around for a while, but uh, it's still an important factor to get that right. The next part is the defect detection. And, and this is where if we can find a defect in the plant, for instance, or at a VPC or at a point where they're going to do repairs or they're going to do fitments, if we can catch it in real time there using AI and correct or fit the part or correct the defect at that point in time, it's a massive cost save. And also back to the title of this session in terms of reducing time to market, we're not waiting then for parts to get sent out to dealers, sent, sent around the place or for repairs or the correct fitments. We can do it there and then and catch it there and then. Um, so there's a huge cost save from that point of view as well as potentially the labor save um, of currently manual inspectors and moving this into an automated way. And you can redeploy those guys to go and find chips and wiring harnesses and whatever else that they should be doing. Uh, and, and automatically we can inspect the cars to a um, potentially a better standard. The liability is a really interesting one. And I know we've got a real mix and range of people. I know some of the people have already had some good conversations with. I guess you guys are on both sides of the fence. From an OEM perspective, you want the car to get out there as quickly as possible. You want it to move through the through the different handovers, when you're receiving the car, you want to make sure you're not inheriting damage. And that's a, really, that's a really hard thing. And it's always quite contentious. And I'm sure everyone's experienced those sort of emotional arguments and not being able to uh, evidence anything. And you, know, you probably have it less here, maybe not this morning, but in the UK, anytime you get a manual inspection, which is, used to be pen and paper and a camera, it just says gray, raining and dark. Um, and, and no one really knew what the condition of the car was. You've got better weather here, so hopefully that's a bit easier, but it was always tricky to then look back when it gets to a dealer several weeks later and work out where, where the liability lay. Um, and being able to just catch that and ourselves, and, and um, I think Vivek, who's going to speak shortly from prison with a similar system, being able to capture the condition of the vehicle at that point and being able to use that has created much stronger relationships um, with our customers and their suppliers it's protected people that were inherited damage. And more importantly, we can then find out where the damage is happening. So you can start to reduce it and you can improve quality on that as well. Then the last part is around remarketing. Now, 
It's not something that um, we, we kind of intended, but as we're finding more OEMs are thinking about direct to consumer models or agency models, or even second life models that come back through plants and compounds in the same way, those images can also be used to get data to the customers earlier. Your car's on its way, it looks like this, even from reselling those cars or directly selling those cars online. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a use case that's born out of um, the recent COVID stuff and being able to move everything online rather than in physical presence. So where does this all lead? And, and kind of, you know, I'll then leave it, leave it there and hand over to the, to the next people and we'll get in some discussion. But we, we thought many years ago we kind of had this vision. And actually, this is a really odd slide. And to me, it looks really dated. But um, I still think it rings pretty true. The only thing I would change about this now, this is some of our products. And this is kind of what we would see as a, uh, I know this is UK centric, but the same rule would apply anywhere. And, and we have this in play today. We have systems at plants. Then as the vehicle leaves the plant and goes down to a port, we have a system at a port, gets on a ship, goes to another port. We have other systems at those ports. And then when it gets to the dealer, we have um, a, a dealer app. And when a claim is then created, it links everything back so you get that traceability and visibility. And that information is shared with the claims handlers. It's shared with uh, the OEMs, the different partners in the supply chain as they need to see it. Um, and, and this is something that's really helped some of our customers that we're working with. I said there'd be a change. The change that I would make, when we started this, you know, we were perhaps a little bit mad and we thought that there would be a de Gaulle system in every port around the world. We'd have them in every plant. It's so unrealistic. And what we've realized and what we've tried to encourage and embrace is actually, there's not just us doing this now. There's, there's a handful of other um, suppliers, which is great because between all of us, we've still got a tiny fragment of the market. So there's plenty for everybody. What's important is that everybody needs to work together and collaborate. So you could swap out any of those systems that I'm saying are de Gaulle systems. It could be any other supplier in those. It can even be a manual inspection. But what's important is the data. As an OEM or even as a, a logistics provider, you just want the data. You don't care what the hardware looks like. You, shouldn't, you don't really care to a degree who the supplier is. But the data that comes out of it, the images, um, the analytics on those images, the AI, et cetera, you need to know that. Um, and that needs to be in a place, be it blockchain. I was just having a conversation with a company here, Vinturas. Um, from a blockchain perspective, it facilitates this beautifully. And it means that information can seamlessly get into your own systems. Um, and I think that's a pretty good point to, to pause, if that's okay, uh, and, and pass across to the next person, Richard. I think it's Hamed from, from Soul Robotics. Um, and then we can talk a bit more about this shortly, if that's okay. Great, thanks very much. Fantastic, thank you. I'll take that. Um, if you, uh, yeah, oh, just take, take your seat one at a time for now. And uh, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, a great start. And uh, without further ado, I want to invite my next guest up, uh, Hamed Bazaz, Director of Business Development at Soul Robotics, another game-changing innovation. Uh, Hamed, welcome to the stage. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Richard. Uh, pleasure to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about Soul Robotics, what we do, and the technology that we've developed for finished vehicle logistics. So with that, I'll share a brief introduction about the company, and then I'll dive into the technology itself. So Soul Robotics, as you may have guessed, is a technology startup based out of Seoul, South Korea. We make 3D perception software. What that means is we take data from different types of 3D sensors. Now, that can be LiDAR sensors, 3D camera, radar sensors. We fuse that together into one environmental model, and we enable customers to make complex decisions. So to put that into perspective, what you see on the screen here is uh, a LiDAR sensor has been mounted on top of a vehicle. That vehicle is driving through typical inner city traffic, and um, what our software is doing is uh, gathering all the data surrounding that vehicle and detecting, classifying, and tracking objects. Those can be other vehicles that are noted in the, in the red boxes, pedestrians in the green boxes, or cyclists in the yellow. And then with that information, as you can imagine, we can then help the vehicle navigate a safe path to go from point A to point B. Now, that same technology can be used across a variety of different applications um, that can be not only for, for driving purposes, but also for airports, for security, 
uh, warehouses, but also intelligent transport, highways and intersections, for instance. Now, back to the finished vehicle logistics sector. We realized um, a, a pain point in the marketplace and, and an opportunity to leverage the technology that we've developed to solve a challenge that um, everyone I'm sure here in the audience is familiar with, and that is at uh, vehicle logistics facilities, at auto OEM plants, there is literally an army of drivers whose only responsibility is to um, drive the car off the assembly line to the next point in the QC process, the after treatment process, whatever the case may be, and eventually load that car onto a truck, a train, a ship, uh, wherever it may be going. And obviously this process is highly labor intensive. Um, and so we, we recognize this opportunity to, to tackle this pain point and to, and to use our technology. What you see on the screen here is actually from the Tesla Gigafactory in Shanghai. In spite of Tesla having supposed uh, full, full self-driving capability, they also use drivers. Um, and you can see dozens of drivers walking around loading those cars. I'll show a short video, uh, give an overview of how the technology works, and then I'll, um, I'll help digest it here in a moment. Hello, we're Solar Robotics. Solar Robotics is building game-changing technology to bring autonomy to first and last mile logistics. Our solution, the Level 5 Control Tower, can automate thousands of vehicles with only a few sensors. It's called Autonomy Through Infrastructure, and it's the first of its kind. Autonomy through infrastructure is an alternative to having sensors, computers, and software all installed on board autonomous vehicles. Instead, perception, planning, and control are enabled by smart infrastructure through the cloud and V2X technology. The result is that non-autonomous vehicles can be driven autonomously as long as they're connected to the level five control tower grid. Solar Robotics is the most advanced, most innovative, and most accurate robotic perception company in the industry. If you want to automate your parking logistics, Solar Robotics will provide full stack autonomy through infrastructure, the level five control tower. So there was quite a bit of content in that short video clip. I just want to break it down, how our technology works. So it, it can fall into three pieces. Effectively, first is perception. We mount sensors onto the perimeter of a facility. That could be, for example, uh, an auto OEM plant will mount sensors onto the fence line, onto uh, buildings, lampposts, um, whatever the uh, scenario may be. And then we use those sensors to perceive the environment and identify where all the vehicles are at any given point in time. Not only vehicles, but also people as well. Uh, and then we plan a route for how can the vehicle get safely as it rolls off the assembly line? How can it get to the next parking lot? the next QC test track, the next after treatment process, and eventually onto the ship, the truck, or the rail that will take it to its final destination. And then lastly, wireless control. We beam a command to the car to say, turn left, turn right, stop, or go straight. And uh, through these three elements, we can effectively autonomously control a vehicle, a vehicle that by itself does not have any autonomous capabilities. Um, so we're not changing anything on the, uh, on the car itself. We're not adding any hardware or software. We are simply controlling the vehicle with the existing um, capabilities that it has. And this is not just a concept in theory. We're actually doing this. We've implemented it with BMW um, at one plant, and now we're rolling it out across their plants globally. You can imagine the implications of um, of deploying this type of technology from a safety perspective, you no longer have hundreds of employees walking around your um, OEM plants or logistics centers driving vehicles. Um, they are automated and there, there's no blind spots. You can see it from multiple angles. From an efficiency point of view, uh, you're not tied to the manpower and, and shifts. You can operate this 24-7. And from an economics point of view, the system pays for itself within one to two years. So 
With that, that's a brief overview of what we're doing uh, in applying technology to the finished vehicle logistics space. I look forward to speaking with some of you on the exhibit floor and, um, and, and the panel of discussions here in a moment. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. It's fantastic. Um, let's bring on my, uh, my final guest, if I can see him in the room, uh, Mr. Vivek Sinha, managing partner of Sphere. So, Mr. Vivek, please, welcome to the stage. Take it away. Thanks. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll jump right into this, uh, give you a quick overview of the company and our product. Uh, we've been in business for about 20 years now, working in the finished logistic uh, uh, space. Uh, we are a unique blend of uh, a software solution framework that is customizable, configurable based on every implementation. We have a unique methodology on how we engage with our customers, work bottom up to configure our solutions. And our solution framework integrates with your ecosystem, so you don't have to, so the solution is not independent it integrates with the rest of your uh, application framework and, and workflows. We have also been very fortunate to have worked um, uh, across the finished vehicle logistics space. Over the last 15 years, we have worked with transportation companies, logistic companies, um, ocean carriers, railroads, et cetera. So we have a diverse uh, and deep experience in this, in this industry. And when it comes to Damage detection, this is uh, a product we launched um, uh, over the last few years. Uh, we have extensive experience right from manual detection using mobile applications to a fully autonomous automated inspection solution we call PRISM today. Uh, the, the solution basically is custom built, custom designed. Uh, for the implementation. It could be outdoors in extreme weather conditions. Um, it could be minus 40 degrees to, to, um, to high, you know, or high wind um, and, and dusty um, uh, conditions. We have an implementation right next to a concrete pipe plant. So there's an enormous amount of dust coming in and, and the solution works autonomously um, outdoors. Uh, this, the solution comes with up to 20 um, high megapixel 4K to 10K cameras, video cameras. These are smart cameras that talk back to you. So if there's any downtime, if there's any problem with the camera, it talks back to you, lets you know if there's a, if there's a problem. Uh, these videos are encrypted, so can be used in the code of law uh, in case there's a challenge. Um, and again, there are a whole bunch of sensors and scanners to detect uh, motion and, and other uh, parameters within the, within the pod. So what happens in a real life scenario as a car drives through, um, go back one second. Can we go back a couple of slides? Thanks. Um, so in a, in a real life scenario, a car drives through the pod. In three to five seconds, we inspect the car. We identify the car. We wind read the car. Uh, there's a unique identifier. Um, we detect damages, create a packet, and then kind of um, archive it in the cloud. And could be archived for anywhere from six months to eight, 18 months based on your business process. Um, and all this is done in real time. Um, so as cars go through the pod, you could then monitor it using a dashboard or, or um, your, your KPIs to, to identify patterns, identify damages, identify driver behavior, and then loop that back into the solution to um, improve the solution setup. Uh, our computer vision solution goes beyond the pod. So we have analytics and video analytics to monitor the yard. Uh, detect uh, motion, detect uh, directional awareness, detect uh, heat maps and activities to identify areas in the yard for inbound and outbound. So there are several other analytics that ties into this, and these systems talk to the central, the central platform then, that can then talk to your systems. So it's a, it's a bi-directional conversation, and it's, it's all, this all happens in real time. 
uh, with multiple pod scenarios, these pods talk to each other. Uh, you, you can have one central database to kind of search for uh, the vehicle lifecycle management and see where the vehicle has been and the condition of the vehicle throughout the life cycle uh, with built-in alerts and notifications. So if there's a damage, if there's an anomaly, the system would talk back to you and flag that back to you. And again, all this can be monitored using your, your dashboards and analytics, uh, analytical reports. So overall, the solution framework comes with a set of scanners and cameras. Uh, it has advanced analytics and AI to, to kind of put this all together and, and report back and create an incident report. And that's, that's the solution. That's the, that's the solution framework um, um, in totality. And the framework then integrates with your existing systems, like your gate check-in, your inventory management, yard management, claims processing, et cetera. So it's an integrated environment uh, for, for, for your operations. And that's, that's the solution framework. Um, and again, we're around. We're looking forward to engaging with you over the next couple of days. I want to stay on, the, stay on the stage, please, and I uh, invite my uh, other speakers to uh, join us as well. So please do. Thanks. So clearly um, some fantastic innovations, um, some exciting solutions there. Um, some people at these conferences over the last few years have said um, the vehicle logistics can be deemed to be stuck in the Stone Age, um, perhaps lagging behind other sectors uh, within the automotive supply chain. Um, clearly, there's exciting technology. We've had about autonomous vehicles, blockchain, cloud technology, AI. Um, heard that from the provider side. How do these, how do these sort of comments and, um, uh, and thoughts match the conversations with your customers? And I'll start with you. In terms of technology use in, in, in the yeah. supply chain, you mean? Yeah, I, I think, um, like I touched on, I think, the, I think there's been a shift in attitude. I think previously there was lots of excitement and a lot of companies and you know, they seem to have a department that was about digital transformation, but it probably wasn't the priority because the investment was all into plants, a lot about electrification, a lot about autonomous driving, some of the other exciting things that we've heard about. Um, but actually in the last few years, given the headwinds in supply chain, and um, which, which we all know about, I think it's accelerated it. Um, and, and actually, I've seen a, an attitude shift. I've seen people realizing it helps as well. You know, I think with, with all the different solutions, we're all fairly new in these particular types of solutions. The more success that we all have, and I'm sure these guys will agree, it kind of brings in more success. And if some, someone once said, you know, OEMs all want to be number one, they just don't want to be first. And if you can get the first things in and you can get some successes and some great business cases and people can understand the benefits, um, then it's easier to sort of carry that on into future things. So I, I'm seeing, I think the answer to that question might have been different a few years ago. I would have said that, yeah, it's probably lagging. Now I think it's catching up quickly. And I think the opportunity is there to sort of become a bit of a leading light from a digital and technology point of view. I don't know how you guys agree or find that. I think I would, uh, I would uh, echo a lot of Ed's comments. Um, I think historically, um, the logistics sector, it's true, has been uh, lagging behind in terms of digitalization. And um, a lot of the focus, a lot of the investment was on, um, was on the manufacturing side of cutting costs, of optimizing tooling, um, whatever the case may be. And I think now there's, there's been the attention and the space to, to address some of the challenges around finished vehicle logistics. And um, so, I, so I do think that there, you know, in, in the last few years, there has been a lot more interest um, and a lot more investment uh, behind that. So, um, yeah, it's changing, and it's changing quickly. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And I think a lot of our innovation is driven by customers. They are now starting to ask and push for more um, to kind of overcome the gap, probably, and also the challenges of today's market. So um, the market is definitely ready. We see a lot of customers um, engaging uh, companies like us and pushing us to, to innovate and innovate faster. Excellent. And uh, you know, with, uh, with the great resignation taking right, right now, uh, taking place you know, right now, we're seeing potential faster adoption, you're saying. Um, if people are seeking you out, seeking that technology out, when it comes to that investment, 
I'm, I'm keen to delve into non-commercially, but you know, how those conversations go. Um, you mentioned a return on investment, for example. Now, typically in, in, in automotive, return on investment had to be um, very quick, um, you know, less than a year, six months. Um, are we seeing a change in that and uh, an, an evolution in a realization that maybe some long-term investments for major infrastructure and uh, uh, key solutions, such as yourselves, but also others, um, you know, is that evolution happening? I'd say so. I'd say, um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, some of this needs real alignment, and, and it comes back to the word we've kept hearing today is about collaboration. And I don't just mean supplier to supplier collaboration, but it used to be, in my view, that uh, the OEMs would kind of have a view, and then the um, logistics providers might have a view, and then you've kind of got technology, and they kind of liked the idea of things, but they didn't know who was going to lead it, or they kind of weren't necessarily all aligned. And I've seen a lot more closer alignment in that, and I think, again, this has stemmed from some of what we've seen in the last few years. In terms of labor, and in terms of return on investment, if you can show people and you can prove that there's, there's something quick, so in our case, you know, w one, of the, one of the strong um, arguments for this is you've got labor, particularly at, say, a port or terminals, and we've just seen a video um, that you showed of a, of a yard. Um, and, and there's lots of people around. But also, in terms of this time to market, you've got cars that arrive maybe at a terminal um, at whatever time within 24 hours, and maybe it's not on the day you thought they were going to arrive anymore. And then someone's got to go and inspect those cars. So they've got to be put somewhere. Someone's, an inspector's got to get to them. Then they've maybe got to be moved and they've got to be put somewhere else. I think our technology, Vivex technology and others, it's great if the vehicle just arrive and just go through and it's just done. And then it can go and get put away or it can go and get somewhere. So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, where people are seeing these wins and seeing be able to create that, either because there is staff shortages and it's kind of a bit enforced on them or just because they understand it now and they're able to do it. But I think it all comes to the alignment. Both parties have got to agree. So if it's an OEM and a yard or a shipping line or a railhead, they've kind of both got to buy into the fact they're all going to rely on these images. Um, I've been involved in a piece of work with uh, the ECG, which are based over in, in Europe. I think they're one of the sponsors. And this was all about uh, understanding best practice for these sorts of digital vehicle handovers, as we called them. And actually, we've come up with a framework and a legal framework so people can adopt these technologies more. Um, and also kind of best practices to align the different suppliers that are coming into the market and make sure things go the way. And all these small things, I think, are helping to, to nudge that in the right direction. Yeah. Interesting. And, and you know, keeping on that theme of serving um, global markets, uh, all three of you serve uh, different regions around the world. Is there a different approach in terms of digitalization, advancements in that area, automation, uh, a willingness to invest versus the U.S.? Um, absolutely, yeah. You know, we're primarily based in the U.S. with most of our customers here, but we're starting to look at markets. Um, uh, we're starting to engage with a customer in the Middle East, and we see uh, willingness. And, and also, I think the platform they have existing is uh, probably better than <laughs> what we've seen in the U.S. Mm. Uh, with contactless check-in processes and things like that. And uh, the out-of-the-box requirement to integrate with the other systems so I think there's willingness and readiness um, in markets outside the U.S. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, I think there's there's multiple elements to it. I think um, on one hand, the U.S. is a very big, mature market, so there's a lot of opportunity. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of existing infrastructure, and um, sometimes that can be that can be a challenge, right, to to retrofit existing infra infrastructure. So. In some of the emerging countries, we've seen um, a lot of interest because they're able to essentially leapfrog um, the technology by investing first time in the latest and the greatest technology. And I think that opens a door um, to a certain extent. So um, yeah, I think, I think there are differences in different regions. Um, and I think it's, it's important to understand those dynamics and, 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 and try to um, help the customer uh, fit with whatever they're looking for. That's an interesting one on the, on the, on the retrofit side <laughs> versus the, the new build. So is the approach different? Is the conversations different? Um, startup versus existing players? You know, we're seeing a lot of investment from the uh, existing traditional OEMs into, into their factories and new setups. Um, but also there's an excitement uh, and a lot of 
um, new plants being built around the EV space in particular. So different opportunities, different conversations. Yeah, I'd say so. And I, and I think, you know, to echo what the guys have said, the US has actually been um, really good for us, really fertile. But when you have legacy systems, you have a mature market, it, it, some of it is just by nature fragmented. Some of it, um, you know, has, it has its issues and it's harder to correct some of those. Some of the systems and processes are quite convoluted. They go, great idea. How do we get that practically into our process? And then you look at the process and the process was wrong in the first place. So technology kind of can help, but you've got to meet us halfway. And I think where there's greenfield sites, where there's newer things, be it newer manufacturers, new OEMs and uh, JVs coming into the market, um, but also the, the tooling up of electrification creates loads of opportunity. And certainly, I, I don't know for you guys, but certainly something we've seen, even though if it wasn't their priority, if you're going to almost start with a blank canvas and now you, you're wiser because you've got all this new technology at your fingertips and you can, you can find all this technology and it's out there, it's easier to implement at the start and get it right at the start. So that's a huge opportunity, but quite often you're in a conversation where it, you're probably not going to realize it for two to three years. So it's also the kind of patience and the build up in that process as well. Um, and it's shifting things, we talked about it earlier, shifting things from kind of a POC nature or proof of concept where that's okay and you can kind of get the buy into how do you replicate that over and over and make it standardized um, across an OEM or through a supply chain. No, I, you know, uh, I think overall the shift, um, both from the product mix perspective um, and, you know, the market readiness, we, we see that, we, we see that all the time. Um, and I echo exactly what, you know, Ed had to say right now. Yeah. So how, does, how do these technologies then fit into the wider uh, digital transformation projects? You, you mentioned already that you know, you're starting to see an expansion of that. Perhaps it was a smaller division, smaller projects or task force. But now that's, you know, fully across, um, fully across supply chain management. How do the individual technologies fit in? And all three of your technologies could potentially complement one another, work side by side. So how, as an OEM, um, yeah, make those decisions and how can they build that into their ecosystem uh, and identify the right path and, and partners for them? I think one thing I would say is we've, we've realized that it's, it's critical, it's essential to tie into those, those legacy systems that, that Ed was talking about. And, Without doing that, it's, it's difficult to, um, to have a starting point for implementing the technology. Uh, and so in our case, um, uh, when, when we're implementing this at a, at a typical manufacturing site or a vehicle distribution center, um, we have to tie in with the system that, that tells us where the vehicle is destined for uh, and what are the checkpoints, what are the touch points that it will experience on the way. So for example, if it needs to uh, go to this test track, if it needs to go for this after treatment, um, if it needs to be loaded onto a ship at, uh, on a particular date, um, all of that is, is critical information. And so we have to tie in with the existing systems. Um, there's just no way around it unless there's the greenfield application. Um, so we, we see the same. I mean, um, I, I think there's a lot that people can do, but I also think as suppliers, the onus needs to be on us because you want to make it easy and you want to make it accessible. So we've got to create um, a platform and, and uh, an integration, an API, whatever it may be, where the data can transfer easily. And you know, I like, to, uh, I think it was Steve from Kia was talking about the example of the of the pigs with IBM earlier. You know, I, I don't see why that can't happen with cars. And to be honest, in some of our situations, that already does. The car goes through our system. The AI will flag if there's a defect. They don't want to let that out the next quality gate then we spin that car around and they go and repair it from there. But putting in the hardware is one point, getting uh, the, the sort of, um, getting that uh, hardware correct and then also getting the sort of AI correct uh, and everything tuned from that point of view. And then there's the IT integration and sometimes that's the slowest part. And I think where we can help is kind of preempt that and get things ready so it makes it easier when you have these departments. And in terms of which department, there's no getting away from the fact that anytime we try to do a project, you're kind of dealing with maybe the plant quality team or the finished vehicle logistics team, but then you've got the IT team and then you've got the other suppliers and then it kind of, you know, it just stacks and stacks. And so you it, the onus is on us, I think, for that and to make our things accessible.
Yeah. And, and clearly that's just within one organization. And what we've heard already throughout today is sector-wide collaboration, not least in the, in the session before, uh, how can trucks speak to rail, uh, speak to the OEMs as well, and kind of manage the supply chain collectively. Is I'll just the, add, add to the dig yeah. digital transformation piece, right? So digital transformation is about automating a process, right? Not just an activity. And there are two aspects. One is internal automation within a yard or within a plant, and then there's external within the supply chain. Um, just getting multiple aspects of the workflow automated within an organization could be a challenge. Um, there's, there's inspection, there's outfitting, uh, servicing, and there are multiple touch points just within a yard where the vehicle is touched upon and moved several times and needs to be inspected. Um, and I think that is technically easier said than kind of integrating across the supply chain. And that's where I think partners like us can come in uh, with open platforms and ability to share data more easily um, to kind of integrate and have a flow of data across the supply chain. So I think one's got to start looking at digital transformation from process perspective as opposed to an activity or an event. Mm. Say, well, we've got this automated, we've got inspection done, now what? I think on that, we, we've seen some interesting stuff. So if, you know, where we've had scenarios where we started at a port, for instance, and quite often at a port, you're going to have multiple OEMs coming through the same port. So you put a facility like as in or like Vivex in, you've got a multi-tenant system straight away. So that same set of data is great for the port, and they've got huge efficiencies. Instead of having different processes and different things, if you can streamline and find efficiencies running everything through the same system, as soon as it's dropped or as soon as it comes off a ship, within a few seconds of getting that data, that, that's a huge win from them in terms of labor, time, etc. But it's then disseminating that information to each correct party and keeping all of that secure. And what we've seen is if you start at the port, very quickly the OEMs on their line say, okay, well, we need this as well because you, kind of, you need to have fares fare or it might go the other way and further upstream. If you start at the end of the plant line, quickly you realize uh, we were up in Detroit yesterday speaking to one of our customers and then met some of their potential suppliers where they're seeing the other end of it suddenly their claims are getting pushed in one direction or the other, you must find exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, we kind of probably chuckled to ourselves then because we're like, we did tell you this was going to happen. And actually that, that sort of has a knock-on effect throughout. So you don't get away from that alignment and everybody having to buy into the process. But I, I, I strongly believe that's got to come from the OEMs in the first place. It's much easier if it's kind of OEM out and they're passing that message on and trying to encourage suppliers to go and invest in the technology and be willing to kind of change some processes um, you know, change some uh, old legacy things, but also invest a little bit in that as well. You know, uh, you know these things aren't always done um, first time, and sometimes they need a bit of upfront investment to be able to get things moving a little bit. So I do think that's a two-way street in terms of OEMs and suppliers, and, and, and as well as us. Absolutely. We're, we're getting quite close on time, so if anyone does have any questions, please do uh, raise your hand. It's a little bit bright, but I'm sure we'll, um, we'll have someone running with a microphone. Um, Let's look to the future, um, which is always exciting. Uh, but in terms of future-proofing your own technologies and uh, ensuring that you know, your customers are investing in, in the right solutions, you know, how are you going about this with technology advancing at an ever-quickening pace? How do, you, how do you make sure that your solutions are going to stay relevant and, and how, in general, can people ensure that their technologies don't get outdated um, you know, too soon? Uh, I think there's a few elements to that. One is, um, uh, I think, with, with digital solutions, a lot of the, the, um, the interesting technology is actually embedded in the software. And so um, software is a, is a lot easier, less capital intensive to update than, than hardware is. Um, so if the hardware is, is providing sort of the base fundamental capability and then you improve your AI algorithms, you improve um, your detection capability, you improve the way that you analyze the data, all of that allows you to keep your, your um, technology evergreen and to continue adding value to the customer over an extended period of time. So I think um, that software-centric solution is, is really what helps to prolong the life of, of these um, technologies. So we've seen and discussed some extraordinary innovations and game-changing technologies here. Um, you know, real, gonna have a, and are having a real impact on the, the vehicle logistics sector. Um, 
what's coming next, be it from your own companies, in the industry in general, uh, what can we expect sort of further down the line? That's it. Vivek, I'll, I'll come to you. Sure, I, you know, I think our immediate challenge um, is aligning with operations. You know, we, we see several tactical challenges. Um, change management is a, is a huge challenge and how we roll out these automated solutions and have uh, both terminal operators and, and overall organizations adapt to it. Um, so we basically have a quick feedback mechanism on how we could uh, get that feedback, incorporate that in the product itself for quick adoption. Um, and, and you know, that's, that's our immediate short-term challenge. And long-term, like Ahmad said, it's mostly software, which is easier to um, innovate and change and, and roll out. Uh, and that's a continuous process. So that's, that's something that, that, you know, that's, that's our core and that's, that's basically what we've got to continue to do. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, as we wrap up this session, final thoughts then, um, next steps for technology, the adoption, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think we've got a, a huge opportunity. I, I think because of how chaotic things have been in the last few years, I think there's a massive opportunity coming out at the end of it to um, make some changes and, and kind of dive into dive into digital, trust us a little bit as technology providers that, we can, that we've got solutions. Um, and, and rather than sort of fall at some of the early hurdles and some of the obvious kind of barriers to entry, just explore that a little bit and, and work with us to be able to understand how we, can, how we can help you and how we can explain how we've helped others. Um, and I think exactly as these guys say, that the hardware is absolutely key, but the kind of over the air and software developments, we've, we've had a big shift in the last few years from a kind of what we call a hardware company to a software company, and, and it shows in, in the people that we're employing. Um, but we've got to stay at the sharp end a few years ahead and see what's coming next, and, and ultimately listen to, listen to the customers, but we need to have that, that feedback from them to be able to create what they want us to create. Final thought? I think for me, the, the exciting thing is finished vehicle logistics is just a starting point, and we see some of these same technologies, you know, in the case, in our case, autonomy through infrastructure, being deployed across many applications. So you imagine you go to a car rental facility, you know, when you return the car, there's a driver, he takes the car, he takes it to the car wash, he takes it to pump gas, um, you know, all these different touch points, and there's no reason to have a driver. Um, and so there, there are a lot of applications where um, similar technology can be applied, and, and, and for me, that's really exciting. Great. Well, I think that's a perfect way to wrap up. So an exciting future ahead. But these technologies are here, are real now. So thank you once again to my panel.